Okay. Heading into 2 Kings. Let's go before the Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. Lord, it, uh, it's always a privilege and a great responsibility not only to speak your word, but to listen to your word, to hear your word. So, Father, as we come tonight, focus our attention on that which is vital and important. Lord, we, we ask yet again that our hearts would be soft and responsive, and that, Father, that we would see where many have fallen and failed, and that we would not follow that pattern. I wish I could tell you, it's great news tonight. <laughs> but we've got we've got another king or two where uh, we'll get to, to praise the Lord a lot, I think. But we've got some difficult ones to go through. Um, we've got Uzziah who reigned for fifty plus years. And mostly, well, until his heart was lifted above where it should be. He thought, wow, this is going great. And, and then he decided, well, I can be a priest. And that's not a good thing to usurp a period that God, or a place that God has reserved for others. Um, we finished up, second, well, we were in Second Kings as we went through the <laughs> 0 to 60, the other way, 60 to 0. <laughs> Uh, in six kings, uh, just horrible, right? <coughs> king after king murdered. The guy would take over, and he would, and God would say again, "Oh yeah, they were, they were bad. They were bad, just like Jeroboam." Um, and uh, so we went through from Azariah to Pekah, and uh, he ends up dead. The, the bright spot of Second Kings fifteen was Jotham, and that was a short reign. Um, the significant thing that, if we get that far, that gets reversed is in verse 35. Uh, although he did, according to all that his father Uzziah done, he did what was right, verse 35. However, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed, burned incense on the high places. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. And again, he connected together the palace and the temple and made it vital. He made that connection. Okay? Um, and uh, then what we see is that Ahaz, his son, will reign. And so that brings us to 2 Kings chapter 16. Uzziah is his granddad, fifth year, fairly good reign. Jotham's his, son, his father, fairly good reign, that's what's right in the sight of the Lord. And now we come to Ahaz. In the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was twenty years old when he became king. He reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. And even though he had a godly heritage going in, he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. So not only did he have his father, his grandfather, but he had the first king to look back to and say, wow, this is, this is the way my heart is supposed to be. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Realize how heart-wrenching that should be. I mean, that, that, I don't, I, we'd have to go back to Ahab, right? When Ahab is, is, is reigning in, in Israel and we get the failure coming over into Judah and, and leading the people all, all messed up. Here Ahaz chooses to follow the northern kings. And they've just gone from 60 to 0. They're crashing and burning. And he's like, oh yeah, that looks like a good idea. Let's do that. Because it's bad. Indeed, he made 
his son pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. All right? And that means that they took the statue of Molech, uh, uh, bronze or metal statue, burned fire within it, and placed the infant children in the arms of the mother. How do we go from grandpa and dad? We are one generation away, right? We need to very much remember that. It gets turned on its ear really quick. He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the high, on the hills, and on every green. Now, you probably should remember Ahaz, because it really wasn't that long ago that we talked about Ahaz. Back at Christmas, when we were looking at Isaiah chapter 7, and we were looking at the uh, comforting promise that God gave to the nation in the middle of catastrophe. This is that Ahaz. This is that Ahaz that God shows mercy to. This is that Ahaz that God says, hey, come, turn, turn around. So, 2 Kings 16. This is the situation. Then Rezin, king of Syria, that's the nation to the north of Israel, north, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, the nation north of Judah, came up to Jerusalem to make war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome it. Why? Because God said they could. God says, you won't. This ain't going to happen. At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, captured Elath for Syria, and drove the men of Judah from Elath. Then the Edomites went to Elath, and dwell there to this day. Though they did suffer some loss. <laughs> So it's really only by the mercy and grace of God that they didn't suffer all loss because he's not a good king. <laughs> he's not leading his people well. And it gets worse. <laughs> Second Kings 16, 7. So, Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria. Okay, so, jump back to that map again. Okay, so we have <laughs> little Judah. <laughs> Israel, and then we've got Syria, and we've got Assyria, and Syria's making big noise, and Assyria's got tiglath Pileser, and they're rising. Um, and so Ahaz says, if I can get them up there to attack, maybe they'll leave me alone, mm -hmm. right? And so Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath Pileser, actually tiglath Pileser the third king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Assyria, from the hand of the king of Israel, who rise up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord, and in the treasuries of the king's house, and sent it as a present to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria heeded him, for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus, and took it, carried its people captive to Kerr, and killed Rezin, king of Syria. Right? So he got what he wanted. Pay off. The guy above, and the guy above is a rising star, and he's got an army that's moving along, and it looks like he got what he wanted. <sighs> but God had already come to him and said, Trust me. They can't do anything. In, in a short amount of time, I will have removed those nations. Don't worry about them. And I'm going to send a son, and we think that the immediate fulfillment is Isaiah's son, that, that, this, that this, is, this is a sure sign. And Ahaz chooses, chooses not to trust God. Where should he have looked? He 
should have looked and said, wow, God's given me this promise. God's for my nation. God's chosen us from all the nations of the earth. Why would I not trust him? Instead, he goes, no. He laughs and he has a really neat name. I think we should trust him, right? He sounds like a cool dude. Well, let's go with him. It must have been some kind of hero worship because it just gets worse. Second Kings 16.10 Now King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest to design the altar in its pattern according to all its workmanship. So understand what that's saying. Ahaz goes up to Damascus, he meets tiglath pileser and tiglath pileser evidently has some kind of altar that he's brought with them, and Ahaz sees it, and he's like, wow, that's a cool design for an altar. And so, he sends to Uriah the priest, Pattern. In verse 11, the Uriah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah the priest made it before King Ahaz came back from Damascus. Ding, ding, dong, dong. Woo, woo. I mean, so we just went through Leviticus and Numbers this morning. You know what God did? very specific instructions on how to build a tabernacle, how to build an altar, and uh, I mean, I'll admit, it's not the coolest looking thing I've ever seen, right? It's an altar. You burn animals on it. It's actually well designed, but it's probably not the fanciest thing. But King Ahaz, he's into, he's into style and technology. Um, and he thinks, you know, hey, maybe we got to up the worship a little bit. We got to make it a little snazzier. We can do this. Probably heartbreaking, more heartbreaking than that, is, is that the, the priest priest goes along with it. I mean, we don't even have a, hey, are you thinking about what you're doing? Verse 12, when the king came back from Damascus, the king saw the altar, the king approached the altar and made offerings on it. Hello? Didn't your grandpa have problems with that? Didn't you, haven't you heard the stories? He walks into the temple, he goes to offer, he gets leprosy, he runs out of the temple. He had hastened in, he, he hastened out. God made it clear, this isn't your place. Your heart is risen above. So he burned his burnt offering and his green offering. Hold it. Did you pay attention when we went through Leviticus this morning? God had very specific purposes. So he, I mean, really, if you're going to mess up the worship of God, at least mess it up entirely, please. Don't twist it, right? Well, no, because that's the problem. So he burned his burnt offering, his green offering, he poured his drink offering, he sprinkled his blood, his peace offerings on the altar. He's, he's all in. He also brought the bronze altar, which was before the Lord, from the front of the temple, from between the new altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the new altar. Okay, so for us, I think 
we would think north is a position of prominence. But, I mean, what, what's your favorite direction? North, south, east, west? South. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> There's reasons for that. <laughs> okay, point taken, you win. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. But, I mean, when, when we think of, you know, what's the most prominent position, I mean, our compass has the big north, the big end, right? What's the what's the prominent position for the tabernacle for Israel? East. East. East north is the least. He moves the altar to the least of prominent places. He moves it out of the way because it's in the way of his new altar. Then King Ahaz commanded Uriah to the priest saying, On the great new altar, burn the morning burnt offering and the evening grain offering, the king's burnt sacrifice, his grain offering, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, their grain offering, their drink offering, sprinkle on all the blood of the burnt offering, all the blood of the sacrifice, and the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire of. So, we're just going to replace what was there. Just, you know, I'm more important than God. I don't know what other message you think that would, would make. You know, God, it was fine. You, you set up a good thing here, but I, I like this new altar. It's, it's fancier. Mm -hmm. Thus did Uriah the priest, according to all the king Ahaz commanded. At least in Uriah's time, Ahaziah, the king with two names, the priest stood up to him and told him he could. And then when he came up with Leprosy, they said, Yeah, oh, you get out. We will rise up and we will force you out. We will fight you out. We, this cannot be. And here, he rises in all that can be made. For two generations, we stood as turn. King Ahaz cut off the panels of the carts and removed the labors from them. He took down the sea from the bronze oxen that were under it and put it on a pavement of stones. So, again, evidently this mobile altar wasn't as big as God's. It was just fancier. And so they couldn't see over the labor. Again, remember that the tabernacle it is a slaughterhouse. Okay, There, there are animals after animal after animal being brought, sacrificed, washed in the labor. It's a huge thing on the back of 12 oxen, right? The, the, and it's, it's big because there's just all kinds of animals coming in and they, they, they wash it off. And it's too high. It's lower. Well, let's put it down. So we can get to it so we can use this new altar. Okay. Verse 18, also he removed the Sabbath pavilion which they had built in the temple. Uh, which uh, the thought there was, um, so there were, oh, another verse slipping my mind. There were courses of Levites, okay? They would come and they would serve for so long and then they would, they would cycle through, okay? I mean, we find that as John the Baptist is being born, his father is serving his course in the temple, all right? And the courses would end on the Sabbath. They would switch to the new shift on the Sabbath. But God said you can't travel on the Sabbath. So they built this Sabbath pavilion so that the priests who were coming out of service could rest and relax and restore until the Sabbath was over, and then they could travel back to their home. Um, but to Ahaz, we'll write some new laws. You, I guess you can just go. Okay, you can leave, you can go down. And he removed the king's outer entrance from the house of the Lord. Okay, so do you remember that that's what Joppa had just built? <laughs> just a few verses ago. But, you know, years ago. Jotham wanted to be connected to the house of God. And Ahaz, I've been listening to through um, 
son of uh, Count Peter. One of the points was, yeah, Ahaz was probably a nice guy. We're going to read in a little few generations where they're persecuting the prophets and the godly. And it doesn't seem like Ahaz is going bad. He's just changing the temple worship. He's you know, updating. He's we're styling. We're, what do we got? You know, it's it's going good. We've got to be careful, right? I mean, we 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 need to be careful. He needs to be careful. That. I don't think God's against technology. Okay, I really don't. I'm kind of a technical guy. But I do realize we need to be careful. I need to be careful. We're, we're not coming up with a new way to worship God. Right? And we're not changing the God that we worship, which I think was part of Ahaz's problem, too. This is definitely not the God. Uzziah or John. Uh, this was a God of his own making. And uh, amazingly, it tells us that he does all this because on account of the king of Assyria. Right? So I pay him to come defeat my enemies. And because he did such a great job, I'm thinking, wow, his gods must be pretty mighty. I'll follow them. I don't have an answer. All I know is that his heart is all messed up. Verse 19, now the rest of the acts of Ahaz, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Ahaz rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, then Hezekiah, his son, made in this place. I can't wait till we get there. Mm -hmm. We ain't there yet. <laughs> Second Kings 17. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, he gets to, you know, he gets to reign. Uh, he starts when he's 20 and he reigns. Um, 16 years. So in the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hosea, the son of Elah became king of Israel and Samaria. He reigned nine years. And surprise, surprise, <laughs> he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Right? So it's amazing to me that the guy in the south who's supposed to be following the Davidic line decides he's going to pitch in with the guys from the north. And the guy in the north who takes over four years or 12 years into his reign, says, hey, you know, we ain't got that great a thing going. <laughs> he does evil, but he doesn't do it like the kings of Israel who were before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him. That's the guy who came, comes up after Tiglath, Blazer the third. Hosea became his vassal and paid him tribute money. And the king of Assyria uncovered a conspiracy by Hosea. Uh -oh. Hosea says, okay, look, I realize we're in over our head, and so we're just going to pay you money. Okay, we'll just leave us alone, we'll pay you money. So he, he even skips a step, okay? He doesn't even cry out to God and say, hey, what should I do? Hey, God, would you help us like you help Judah? who isn't even following you, but you helped them. You gave them promise that they would never take Jerusalem. So she just, just take us. But, kind of lies about it, and then he comes up with a, a conspiracy um, the king of Assyria uncovered a conspiracy by Hosea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt. So, where Judah went to the north of Israel, Israel goes to the south of Judah, um, and he hires the king of Egypt to come up. Uh, he brought no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. He's looking for help in all the wrong places. I mean, really? Have you not listened to the fact that God delivered you from Egypt? Where are you 
you going? Now the kingdom of Syria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria. He placed them in Hala and by the Hamor, the river of Hosea, and in the cities of the Medes. Understand, this is the end. This is the beginning of the end. They have tested God over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And when we read Numbers this morning, and God said, ten times, I'm ready, I'm done with you. This is King number 20, I believe. Not a single one of them that did right in the sight of the Lord. And God is done. So God starts taking them the northern ten tribes and scattering them. Syria's policy was come in, grab the people, and just fling them throughout the empire and, and they'll become citizens. What's more is we'll take them out of here and we'll fling them out and then, well, yeah, we'll get to that part for a little bit. God gives the reasons why he's flinging them. Verse 7, for so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt. And they had feared other gods, and had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel, and of the kings of Israel which they had made. In other words, they had abandoned the first man, right? I shall have no other gods. No other gods. You'll have no other gods beside me. You'll have no other gods under me, before me, around me, over me, nothing. You shall have no other gods. Verse 9. Also, the children of Israel did secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in all their cities, from watchtower to fortified city. And, and again, a, a lot of the commentators bring up the fact that the high places were the false worship of a false god. They were the false worship of the true god. Right? When Jeroboam set up the two golden calves, it wasn't that he was trying to take them away from God. He just wanted them to worship God. Why a golden calf? It just seems like he's got all kinds of wrong connotations. But a golden calf that he built in Dan and Bethel that they would come and they would worship the true God in a false way. Verse 10, they set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill, under every green tree. There they burned incense on all the high places, like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. And they did wicked things to provoke the Lord's anger. For they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all his prophets. Every seer saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes, his covenant that he had made with their fathers, his testimonies that he had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. So, God comes to the end of his patience with Israel. Now, it's amazing to me that he continues to work in Judah. Right? There, it's going to be another hundred years. And God is, is ticked. <laughs> Alright? He's been sending prophets to them as well. And yet, because there is movement within them, they 
have kings who actually try to follow. God withholds his judgment for a while. But Israel is done. They've heard again and again and again and again. And they've hardened their hearts. So, I was telling Phil um, after the second service, one of the things that struck me <clears throat> as I, I was finishing up Paul in Acts 28 is this, and it kind of goes along with the history that Kevin was talking about this morning in uh, Sunday school. So when Paul is originally brought to Rome, okay, Nero, at that point in history, is still rather saintly. Right? He, he's not the greatest Caesar, but he, he's, he's saying that it's a few years after that that he begins in some of the games, and then it gets really bad under the next step. So what if this is the time? Paul comes to Rome. Paul testifies before Nero. We know that Paul is not about to give a testimony where he doesn't confront even the emperor of the world with a sinner, and he needs to come to Christ mm -hmm. as your Savior. And Paul is there for years. And so how many times has he come before you? I don't know. But is it possible that what we see is this that Nero? Presented with the gospel, hardens his heart. Over and over again, and God says, Daniels, you are a fool. And Moses comes before Pharaoh and says, I will not. And God saw, hardens his heart and does stupid stuff. Even Pharaoh's magicians are saying, for Pete's sake, let them go. <laughs> and so Nero decides he's going to blame the Christians. So, they're thinking this week is some of the judgment of God on Nero is to have Christians die. Mm. Mm. And possibly yes. Is that the best that could have happened? Nah. What would have been the best? Nero to repent. At least I think. So now Alexander the or Constantine comes along and he converts and converts the world. And that makes all kinds of a mess. Mm -hmm. Hmm. This I am sure. God's in charge. Mm -hmm. God knows what he's doing. And if God tells you to do something, Lord God, we pray that you would not, that you would help us to see when we are heading in the wrong direction, that the flags that you keep waving would be, would catch our attention. Father God, uh, may our hearts be humble and soft as your prophets speak, as your word speaks. Lord, may we quickly change course. May we quickly cling to you. May we, may we look at what is going on in the world around us and see your hand and get on your train and follow hard after you. Lord, you make that abundantly clear for us this week as we go about our day-to-day -day or 